This conference will now be recorded. I'm going to mute this. Okay. You good? You can't, you can't. Yeah. Nice lighting, Kara. A little dark in the back. Got a spotlight on. Can't hear you though. You've been working on that lighting? No, this is actually no, too much. Too much. <laughs> For my child, my child is, I know it's not, no, it's not. Uh, it's very effective. <laughs> I also can't see without it, so I need it for. <laughs> Good. Okay. People will still be able to hear me. Sure, are you okay? I think I'm good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to go. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a little after um, eight o'clock. Apologize for the lateness. Um, the first item on the agenda, but tonight we have a public hearing and a general meeting, um, time permitting. Um, today is Tuesday, October 20th. We are in room 213, and we're also on go, um, having a meeting via GoToMeeting. The Planning and Zoning Commission um, regular meeting. Um, the first item on our public hearing is a continuation of public hearing regarding special permit application number 315, landfilling and regrading application number 486, Sarah Thornton and, and Robert Thornton and Sarah Thompson at 170 Ridge, Acre Road, Ridge Acres Road. This agenda item was opened on September 29th and has been continued to uh, November 10th. November 10th, 2020. Uh, it allows the applicant to continue to modify the plans and uh, we'll see them in uh, three weeks from today. Sounds good to me, Jeremy. You are you're you're not even out here. Uh, you're can you make your face? You're not visible. Okay, let me work on it. Okay, Hi. Jeremy is here, but we can't see him. Um, the next item on our agenda is site plan application number one eighty six E is in Edward, Dairy and Fire Department, um, eight forty eight Boston Post Road. Proposal to install a shed within the parking lot behind the fire department. The subject property is located on the south side of Boston Post Road, approximately 300 feet southwest of its intersection with Frederick Avenue, and is shown on assessor mapper, map, mapper, well, number 17 is lots four and five in the Central Business District CBDZ zone. Um, these guys had a plan at one point in time to expand the garage and never did it. Is that right? That could be. Um, okay. Jeremy. Today, this Jeremy Ginsburg, Planning and Zoning Director of the Pending application is for a very small shed that will uh, basically take up one parking space uh, a little to the back of the fire department's property in downtown and to the left. It's uh, in that shared part. It will seem like it's in the shared parking lot of the 800 Boston Post Road building. It's going to be used for storage only, uh, various materials stored by the fire department. Uh, the fire department is a special permit use. In, in this zone, so the shed is part of that. Um, the ARB looked at it earlier tonight and approved the design you see with a cream color look uh, rather than the gray look. Dennis Smith from the fire department is here. Uh, Fred has put on the screen the location of the proposed shed. A little tough to see, but you can see where the fire department is. It's circled, and then you uh, have the shed a uh, little bit behind that. Actually, um, I'm not sure that's the right spot. He's got a site plan also in the application package. There you go. That's it. That's a better look at the fire department building and where the shed is generally going to go. Um, so as not to use up parking spaces directly behind the fire department. Um, and you're correct. I miss, I was thinking about the Neroten fire. Neroten. 
they right. did theirs and then so this is the first time we've seen this um would the gentleman from the fire department like to add anything to what jeremy just stated i lost yeah. dennis smith dennis smith you with us there's a good picture showing where the shed will be dennis you have to unmute yourself dennis yep you okay. see Perfect. We got it, Dennis. Thank you. So the shed will be located in the back left-hand corner, just over the split rail fence underneath the trees. It'll take up one parking space in the far back left-hand corner um, of our property. Okay, Dennis, for the record, you're the president of the fire department or you're the executive director or an officer no sir i'm uh i'm a past chief and a uh trustee of the fire department okay then parcel a is parcel a on that map that is parcel a on that map is that 800 post roads parking lot yes it is, okay. it is. just so all the commissioners understand on, on the map that was just up on the screen it says parcel A, 1.168 acres. That is the land site underneath 800 Post Road. That's why it's it's um, designated Darren Fire Department. That's who owns the land under that office building. Correct. Okay. Um, and then the property in question last week, which is a Bank of America building, is like is the next property above that one that you see there was indicated as parcel A. Actually, we, we own a very small pie-shaped piece of property that was donated to us by a uh, previous owner many years ago, a couple of years ago, between the old bank building and, and the state uh, parking lot. So that belongs to us also. That's fine. I just want to make sure that the, the commission understands that there's no real neighbor impact in anything. Not at all. Okay. Um, I'm fine. Does any commissioners have any question with, relative to this application? If you do, just raise your hand. If not, we're going to move on. Okay. Would anyone in the general public like to speak to this application? You see anybody, Fred? Nope. Right on, Steve. Thank you, Fred. Um, okay. With that being said, I don't think there's anything to add, Jeremy, right? Very straightforward, just yeah. dropping a shed on in the back left corner of the property. Right, it's gonna be it's gonna be bolted down or it, it complies with whatever the building problem was. Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, a motion to close this application or this hearing. Jennifer, seconded by Kara. Thank you. All those in favor? Say I Aye. Thank you. Jim <laughs> Rand. Jill, you know, I gotta I gotta show you I'm paying attention. I know. You're <laughs> You're going with the cell phone act, man. I like it. All right, next item up for bid. Um, special permit application number th uh, 316, Darren After School LLC. And the addresses are 10 near Water Lane, 18 Hoyt Street, 395, and 133 Mansfield Avenue, and 7 Old Farm Road. Proposal to operate enrichment and child care programs at each of the town's five public elementary schools for and by contract with the Darien Board of Education. AM and PM programs are to be run for elementary school children on days uh, when school is in session. At Henley School, Home School, Oxford School, Royal School, and Tokening School. The various town properties are located throughout the town in the towns R one third, one half, R1 and R2 residential zones and the municipal use overlay zone. We saw something similar to this at a, at a um, for the schools that we approved. Remember they were doing an after school program? Um, but this is just an after school program and we have to do this because to extend the special permit on most of these, right? Right. What's this is interesting is uh, Nowadays, schools have before school programs and after school programs, and it, the state of Connecticut needs to have it sign off on this. And for the state to sign off, the uh, zoning officer needs to sign off. And what's interesting here is these are this is a private company. This is not the Board of Education running the program. This is a private company 
and I, I see uh, the applicants are here to explain how it all works, but it's basically before and after school at a number of schools in town. Uh, we did refer this out to other departments. The health department uh, had no comments, fire marshal, no comments, police, no comments. The only comment from the health department was relative to COVID-19 protocols, which have been approved by their department. Basically, this would allow this private company to come in and run these operations at these schools. So this is considered a special permit to do this. Uh, so if you have any questions about the programs, how they operate, we, uh, I believe, Haley. Haley Mark Ghost is in the house. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> All right, Haley, why don't you give us a two minute overview of what you're gonna do for our school children and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think you covered it all, but um, you know, more and more families need extended care for their kids. We're already giving them enrichment after school. Um, and we just wanna extend that time to allow um, working families to have their kids stay in their school building and enjoy their afternoon time with familiar faces without a long transition somewhere else. Um, there also is a, incredible demand within Darien that the current resources for childcare are not meeting by far. Um, we had, we sent out a survey and we had an unbelievable response. So there's clearly a demand and a need. And I think a lot of families are looking forward to the idea of having a neighborhood childcare for their kids. Um, so that's pretty much it, unless anyone has any specific questions. In, in, in our application, I got a letter, the commission got a letter from the um, superintendent of schools introducing it. We also do have your detailed overview of the program so everyone can read it at their leisure. Um, I understand why you're in front of us is just because of the special permit and the commission usually just looks at these things um, and moves on. Does anybody in the commission have any questions relative to the application? If you so, just raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Eric Gately? No. I think my only question, and which I think you've answered, but I just wanted to have it really just clarified, is that you'll be in addition to the sort of enrichment after school kind of programs to actually be more of a before and after school child care so that if working families have to get to work or can't, you know, race home and be home at 3.30, it's to provide before and after care in like sort of a familiar environment for the kids that is a little different than, you know, an enrichment program like, you know, soccer or something. Yeah, just that's just... exactly right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So if I have to get to work at 7.30, I can drop my kids off and you're gonna take care of it. <laughs> yeah. no, I think it's long overdue in Darien. So, um, you know, I think it's great and, you know, thank you. Thank you. I think it's Thank over there. Mm -hmm. I concur. As, as a working mom, I also a working single parent in one household. <laughs> I concur. This is awesome. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Any other commissioners? George Riley, did I hear you speak? No, good. Jim Rand, you're okay? I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Would anybody in the general public like to speak to this application? You got anybody, Fred? We're good, Steve. Haley, next time bring a friend to say it's a great idea. <laughs> You're about to do that. Well, as Kara and Jennifer put it, I think uh, you know, if we put that APB out, you would have had hundreds. So <laughs> Yeah, no, we don't have time for that. <laughs> Anything I missed, Jim? Nope. All right. Um, based on that, I would entertain a motion to close this hearing. I think Kara Gately said yes, and Jennifer Leahy second second it. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Haley, you're all set. We'll, we'll Thank you, everyone. Thanks for all you do. Yeah. Take we'll care. deliberate on it next week and then get you um, a resolution. Thank you. Next item on the order to nominate Mr. Lebo. What do you want to do? Um, uh, I'm going to take 108.5 miles, which is the last public hearing item. Wait, 
Got it. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're just going to change the batting order for some of the items. Um, the next application we're going to review is um, Coastal Site Plan Review at 108 Five Mile River Road. So if you guys would reorder your piles, um, I have that the seventh item on our list. Um, here we go. Coastal Site Plan Review number 350, Flood Damage Prevention Application number 402, Harlan Stone, five, uh, 108 Five Mile River Road. Proposal to construct an in-ground pool and associated patio areas at the rear of the residence, eastern portion of the site, and to perform related site development activities um, within regulated areas. The 0 0.52 plus rise acre subject property is located on the west side of Five Mile River Road, approximately 100 feet north of its intersection with Davis Lane, and is shown on the census map number 66 as lot number 33 in the R1 half zone. Tonight, I think we have um, Mr. Levo from- um, William Seymour Associates. Doug DeBest is here as well. And the engineer, Tim DeBartolomeo, is also here to talk uh, a little bit about the project because the pool is, gonna, is proposed for the flood zone. Uh, you may see from the survey that this is an odd shaped lot with the garage coming off of Davis Lane and, and the house well off well to the western part of the property. The proposal is for a pool and adjacent patios to be placed on the east side of the house. I'll call it the Five Mile River side of the house, which is both in the coastal area. It's a little more than 100 feet off the water, but it's uh, certainly within 1,000 feet of Five Mile River. And it's in the flood zone. So because this is uh, within 500 feet of the Norwalk line, we had to refer it to Western Connecticut Council of Governments, as well as the city of Norwalk. Westcog sent comments dated September 22nd. The opinion of Westcog staff is that the proposal is of local interest with minimal intermunicipal impact. Therefore, it is not being forwarded to adjacent municipalities and the regional staff is making no comment. So, as I said, basically it's a proposal for a full right in the back of the house, if you will, in the front of the house, depending on how you look at it. Mr. Stone owns the property directly to the south of this at number 110. But um, Mr. DeVesta and Mr. DeBartolomeo can explain how this will comply with the flood regulations, the equipment will be elevated, things like that, and how it uh, won't have coastal impact on the Five Mile River and its resources. Okay, and just for some of the commission's edification, we have approved um, pools in flood zones before. If they want to put an expensive pool in flood zone and it floods, that happens, and it could happen. But it's their money, not ours. Um, is Mark Lebo starting out for us? Yes. Yes. Mark, hey, sir. Good evening, Mark. everybody. Uh, Mark Lebo with William Seymour and Associates. I'm representing Harlan and Susan Stone at 108 Five Mile River Road. Uh, as Jeremy and, and Steve noted, the, uh, this, this application involves the construction of a pool, uh, integrated spa, and uh, some, some patio and stair areas, uh, portions of which uh, lie within the 1% annual chance uh, flood zone boundary. Um, are you seeing my screen okay? Do you see a, I'm not sure I'm yeah. you're seeing, you are? Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, good. So the, I'm, I'm gonna switch to this drawing here and you can see a rather bold line that kind of splits the, the pool almost in half. Everything yeah. to the right is what's in the flood zone and everything to the left is what is not in the flood zone. Also, if I pan over a little bit, you can see the uh, the 100 foot cam review line here, which is almost coincident with the front yard setback. And you can see that that we're not within the 100 foot cam review area. The property is not direct waterfront being separated by Five Mile River Road and another parcel of land that the Stones uh, own on the uh, on the river side of Five Mile River Road. It's also important to note too that uh, in conjunction with the pool project, 
um, a, a septic system within the flood zone has been abandoned and they've connected to the uh, municipal uh, sewer out there, which is a pump system. And uh, I think that's a, that's a huge plus to get a somewhat older uh, septic system out of the flood zone in the event that something like that were to fail. I think that would be you know, pretty, pretty uh, catastrophic. So we think we have a lot of uh, pluses here. And um, I, uh, Doug DeVesta is here to answer any questions that you might have regarding drainage. As you know, we're not required to provide uh, stormwater storage. We just need to treat for um, stormwater quality. And uh, Tim DeBartolomeo of Sound Engineering Associates is here. He has also provided a, uh, a report that's part of your application package. Uh, stating that the the pool will be designed in such a manner as to uh, uh, be able to withstand any you know flotation, lateral movement, and uh, and and things of that nature that would be associated with the uh, the structural design. Uh, and lastly, I think uh, important to note the the pool equipment itself will be located outside the flood zone so we we don't need to worry too much about that everything is zoning compliant there were no variances or anything that were required with this um so i i think with that i would turn it back over to the the commission members and ask if uh if they have any questions that we can clarify or answer just the first one threshold question, and you indicated to it, Mark, and I think we said it twice. Um, you said the pool equipment is going to be outside the flood zone. Does that mean elevated? The pool equipment? Yes. Steve? Uh, yes, actually, the pool equipment is intended to be back here. It's both, uh, it, it's outside the flood zone, and by virtue of the, uh, and by virtue of the topography is elevated, yes, but it's not elevated within the flood zone. Got it. So it's not on a platform that gets you up to 15 feet. It's on land. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And then just to clarify, the the, the um, stones own both um, 110 Five Mile River Road and 108 Five Mile River Road. Which that is correct. correct. Yes. You made mention something of the land across the street on the on the Five Mile River. That doesn't show up in any of your surveys, but that really is not material to this application anyway. No, no, it's not. And it's not a buildable lot. It's typical of many of the properties that uh, are that that exist along the uh, the riverside to provide, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide property owners on the inland side of Five Mile River with access to the river. Agreed. I percent agreed. We ran into this like um, two weeks ago or a month ago. Okay. Um, it looks pretty complete to me. Does any commissioners um, have any comments or questions relative to this application? Uh, um, Larry Warble, go right ahead. Your hand is up. Your mic yeah, is no, up. These are just these are just a little bit more. Just make sure I understand it. All it all looks good to me. So you have the flood zone lot. The the pool is running through the middle of the flood zone line. So I assume that means that there's it's. I'm trying to read the topography a little bit. Is 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 it kind of built into a, a hillside or something so that the one well, side no. is higher no, than the other? I mean the ground around it. The the property me? the property is the property is actually quite level. Um, it down down by the road edge. It's about elevation ten, and by the time you get up to the uh, the front stairs there, it's really only, you know, maybe about elevation 13. So in that 110 feet, you've you've got roughly two and a half feet change in elevation. So there's actually very little, let's call it grading for lack of a better term, that's going to be associated with this just to create. So maybe um, I should, let me just ask my question differently then. Um, why, why, what's different on one side of the flood zone line and the other side of the flood zone line like why is the line there is it a distance well, that's, that's where fema says it is 
I can answer that a little oh, bit. I'm trying to figure out FEM is really the way I'm asking you here. That's it. Okay, Jeremy, why don't you help me out then? Yeah, what, what happens is Mark has transcribed the line that's on the flood map, which is, as you can see, the I'll call it the elevation 13 line, which should right. technically correspond more so with contour line 13, which is yeah, at yeah, where yeah. the arrow is. So you can see it's not 100%, but you know, FEMA doesn't look to get drill down that that intently uh right. what they're telling us uh the flood line is at 13 this pool is at 13 so it needs to comply with the flood regulations so the line is not following the 13 contour the line is actually the flood line as shown on fema maps and mark just placed it on as fema has represented it even though it's eh, probably off by five to ten feet which is right. difficult in fact, in this location, it's closer than most. Yeah, I wouldn't describe it. Mm -hmm. And it, when, the, when the when the river, if the river swells and it goes, it's going to go up the bank of the river over Five Member Road and then 110 feet into this guy's front yard. And then oh, yeah, yeah theoretically, theoretically to that line, Steve. Right. I, I understand that. So I can. I can add a little bit to Tim DeBartolome here with sound engineering. So this is this is really um, on the fringe of the flood zone. And um, if you will, you have several components of the flood. You have your storm surge and you have uh, wave effects of waves, uh, which is your your run up. Uh, uh, so as you would if you imagine on a beach, you know, you have first of all, you have your 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 water surface elevation and as the waves break on the beach, they they run up the shore. Um, that line is to represent the furthest reach of that run up. So we're really, it's, when this is submerged, the still water elevation at this site is 10.6. Okay, so that's that's the 1%, even though you're in a, in a uh, um, an AE zone of 13, the, the still water, which is the, Water surface elevation without weight, the effect of waves is only 10.6. So you have 2.4 feet of wave action, uh, very, you know, less than what FEMA, uh, why it's an AE zone, because it's less than three feet. Okay, so you're getting very small waves rolling up this lawn during that right. event. Okay, so it, it's it's hardly a flood condition, is, is oh, what no, I'm saying. No, I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm just using this opportunity to try to figure out the mysteries of FEMA. But it, no, but it, no, but it, but, it, but it, I just think it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile. Good luck. <laughs> it's what? Well, FEMA maps. You know, FEMA maps. It, this is taken at Transect 22 off of off of how they map. You know, they they have. I don't recall how many how many data points they have in Darien, but they're miles apart, and mm -hmm. they essentially interpolate between those points. And if you're if you're on, happen to be on one of those points, um, the map is fairly accurate. If you're between any of those points, then the map is not that accurate. So, uh, so in the, in this particular case, the, the land is really flat. Um, you do have the effects of of run up here, uh, but you're just getting a little bit of what I'll say lapping of of water during that event. Um, uh, so, the pool can be submerged. Um, and the idea is to design it in a way that the only time that there would be a problem with this pool is if it were empty during that event and the water and prior to it being submerged, you would end up with a, um, a hydrostatic uplift. So we have pressure relief ports in the floor to take care of that. So that's, that's essentially the, the, the uh, medium design. Because otherwise uh, I can't appreciate how a empty pool can handle are coming through it. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Um, and, and that's the only time it's a problem. So my, my only one more question then. Um, obviously, the residence is outside of the FEMA floodplain. So you're not running into any of those 50% of the appraised value of the home restrictions from FEMA or anything of that nature. No, Can that's sort of FEMA this too, or is it just us? It's just you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, FEMA doesn't. It, they, they won't insure the swimming pool. Yeah. No. I'm okay. Uh, all my questions are done. Thank you. 
Good, good question, Larry. Um, hey, Mark, real quick, can you have someone, is um, Jennifer Anderson here to go over the um, landscaping plan? Because I just want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that there's bushes in front, and that's part of the record. There's bushes on the side. We're not seeing, you know, people jump doing canopers off the pool from Five Mile River or the Five Mile River Road. Well, Jennifer is, is not here tonight. Um, this was sort of a, I think, kind of just a generic landscape plan to show what could be done. Um, okay. If I don't think the stones would necessarily have a problem if the plantings in general were uh, made part of a, a, a condition of the approval, but I don't think we've reached a point where we know what those plantings are going to be um if there's certain things that you want to see be a certain height i suppose right. we could take that into consideration as well obviously the the pool area is going to be surrounded by you know a code compliant fence with the self-closing gates and so forth um, that's what seven feet or six feet the code compliant fence i can't i believe it's only I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's anywhere near that. Four. Right. Yeah. Right. That'd be three feet. Four. four. It, it's four feet. It's four feet. And yeah. 52, four feet. And fifty-two inches to the uh, to the uh, gate release. Okay. So the bushes in front that's on the landscaping plan are those real or imaginary? Um, Harlan, maybe this might be where you can jump in and maybe tell the commission what um, what some of your ideas as far as the plantings are going to be. That's a great pun. Jump in for the pool discussion. Well done. <laughs> um, just, yeah. We're, uh, just say who you are for the record, Harlan, please. I'm sorry? Just say who you are for the record. Yes, uh, Harlan Stone. So I'm the homeowner at 108. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, n none of the plantings exist today except for the trees uh, between us and the property further up five mile. Um, I think Mark said it right. This is, you know, we've met with Jen four or five times and this is the working version, but we haven't landed on any final plantings. The idea would be, you know, a hedge here in front um, with a fence, you know, uh, it, sort of incorporated into the hedge. And we're actually thinking maybe slightly higher than four feet, um, but somewhere in that four to five foot range. And I think we're open to your view in terms of if there are specifics that you want us to follow, we're, we're all ears. It, I, I think I was just really driving at screening. I mean, I don't know if you want the, the people in the five mile and the road staring at you in your pool. And I don't know if the people on the road want to stare at you in your pool. That's all yeah, right. no, I think that's I think that's why we might go a little bit higher than the four feet on the hedge in the front on um, that faces five mile. Okay. So it's gonna be a full screening hedge that you can't see through it, not just like a couple yeah. azaleas. Right. Yeah, okay. although although we hope we'd like to have that gate so we can get in and out from the from the other parts of the yard. Understood. Yeah. We want to get specific on that, Jeremy? No. Okay, that's fine. Um Jennifer Gately, you're um, Mike is over. Well, Kara Gailey. She's Kara Gailey. <laughs> Two girls. Um, Jennifer's the other one. Um, so the pool's in the front yard. Yeah? It's yes. Yeah. It's in the front yard? Yes. So are we concerned, and I know we spoke about the hedges being hired, uh, higher than four feet for resident privacy, but are we concerned that a four feet fence, and I don't know what kind of fence is going to be in terms of you know, this being an attractive nuisance that is not in the backyard where it's less visible to kids biking, walking around, um, you know, is there any concern about that? Because I think a front yard pool on a pretty heavily, you know, highly pedestrian trafficked road is a bit unusual for town. I think, I think it's fine, but. Any thought given to those that issues are just for resident privacy? Well, I mean, I can I can let Harlan speak to that as well. But I mean, certainly, um, you know, it, it we're we're including a, um, a an automatic cover is part of this. 
Um, so so there, there'll, there, there will be that. Um, I would imagine that in addition to the, the gates, which, you know, at 52 inches, certainly a teenager can reach up and open the gate themselves um, without, without assistance. Um, certainly, I, I would think we could, you could have gate or at least pool alarms, if nothing else, um, to warn, you know, ward off anybody you know, trying to act like uh, Burt Lancaster or something. In, so, okay. It is there. Is there something that you would be? I, I mean, I understand your right. concern no, about the well backyard, and they're right there. There's a home between them and the street. They're not easy to, you know. Right. The front pool is is unusual. And, and well, I'm just wondering if that's been considered other than privacy for the residents. Yeah. Well, in so much that do, as, as Jeremy mentioned at the beginning, we have a pretty odd shaped property here. And if we, if, if you check out the screenshot here, you really don't have a decent amount of space for a pool in the, in the back of the house. And it would then, be shaded on, you know, on, on the most important side, that being the south side, potentially by the by the garage. Um, I think I think this location gives it the sun that it needs or wants. Um, I, I certainly understand. I, I don't know. I guess I don't really have an answer to that. I think I, I, I look. I think we're open if there's a particular height or type type of gate or other concerns that the group has we're we're wide open to that we share the concerns i guess on the good news front it's not like it's right on the road it's a pretty good distance okay. from the road to the pool and furthermore in the front of our yard yeah. there is a there is a fence that runs all along the road okay. which we intend to so you'd have to oh, okay. jump, yeah you'd have to jump this okay. fence and then and then go yeah, about 100 feet to the next to the next barrier. Oh, okay. So there's going to be both the remaining the fence that remains on the street side. Is yes. Now that's then, now I'm, yeah. Now I don't know that that fence is uh, four feet. I actually haven't measured it, but oh, there is a there's a wrought iron fence that we intend to keep there. Okay. No, I think that addresses sort of generally what I was sort of thinking about, um, both the distance to the street and that it's almost like belt and suspenders right because there's the fence already that is at street level you know and then a hedge and uh compliant fence around the pool with a gate so i think yeah. you know that certainly seems like belt and suspenders to me in terms of um this kind of being an attractive nuisance to you know children and teenagers. So that kind of addresses what I would, was thinking about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kara. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Jim Rand, you're okay. Larry, you spoke. George Riley's okay. Jennifer, you're good. Okay. Um, would anybody in the public domain like to speak to this application? You, tell me if you see anybody, Fred. Nothing, Steve. Okay. Um, the only thing I can say relative to the fencing, it's building department regulated on heights and widths of, of the slats between them. I think it's like three inches, so you can't get your hands through, some kid can't wiggle through. You know, the privacy part, I'm sure the, the homeowner wants privacy. It's, you know, it's within the setback. You're right, John. I mean, I, care, I echo what Kara said. It's odd to have it in the front yard, but. In Narragansett and in Rhode Island, people have them in their front yard. That's personal preference for the owner. It's legal. Okay, with that said, I would entertain a motion to close this hearing. Uh, Kara moved it, and George Riley, I think, seconded it. Yep. All those in favor? Say aye. Aye. Hearing closed. We'll deliberate on it as soon as we can. And get back to uh, Mr. Stone. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. you too. Thanks. What's up next, Jerry? T1 Boston's posted.
Um, you didn't talk about Darren Ostafans. Yeah, we, well, we covered it in that it's on the water. I just, yeah. Yeah. I just like when we make mention of it. I'm sorry, what are we doing there? 171 Boston Post Road. Uh, next item uh, up for bid. Um, special permit application number 172E as in Edward, site plan. Um, wow, Nosy Realty. G seven, right? Yeah. Real Estate Inc. 171 Boston Post Road. Proposal to amend the existing site plan and special permit to convert a portion of the basement to a food preparation area, convert a portion of the attic to an office and improve and to improve restaurant liquor sales. The 0 0.34 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the north side of Boston Post Road at its intersection with Richmond Drive. And is shown on the assessor's map number 12 as lot 35 in the service business zone. Chairman, what do we got? You may recall that this used to be the Driftwood Diner and then it turned into Darien Diner. And when those were approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning and Zoning Commission, they were approved basically with three very specific conditions. One was no workspace in the attic no workspace in the basement, and no sale of liquor. Uh, <laughs> as you know, the diner's been out of business for a little while. Our, uh, we have a new potential operator, Biagio, who's here uh, on the call today. He's looking to run a new business, Organica, or get that new restaurant up and running. He's been working closely with the health department and fire marshal. The health department has given approval to the concept of finished food prep in the basement and other dry storage in the basement. Uh, they're looking to do a small office upstairs, basically for the owner to manage the operation. The Zoning Board of Appeals has approved these changes. You have a copy of their draft approval in your packet. Um, one of the, without getting too technical, one of the questions for the ZBA was how do they want to respond to each of these? They did approve the uh, option for the owner to sell liquor, wine and beer. And they did approve the at finished attic space for the owner's office and some dry storage. They, the ZBA did approve the food prep space in the basement. But what the ZBA said as part of their approval was, we don't consider this and we're not approving it to be two and a half stories of space. Because in commercial zones, it's calculated a little differently. So I spoke with Bob Maslin a little earlier today. And the way we take that ZBA decision is a very literal decision. You can have that space in the attic or the office, the space in the basement for the food prep, with very specific floor plans, but we're not giving you carte blanche on go ahead, finish them any which way you want. The CBA was very specific. So basically, Bob's here to look for a special permit to reopen the operation, run a new restaurant out of there. Um, I did want to mention that this one of the ZBA's conditions was for some. Uh, new landscaping to match what was approved by the commission many, many years ago. And I met Bob out in the field to discuss that earlier today. And the operator will work with ZBA on getting the details of that. So we do have the health department approval here. The only change they have is a, the addition of a small door in the basement. We're okay with that. That's very consistent with the plans that you have before you. Uh, Bob, do you have anything to add? Before you jump in, Bob, I apologize. Um, okay. I think what you're saying, the, the question was to convert a portion of the basement and a portion of the attic. So it's a portion of it, and the ZBA is okay with that, not the entire basement, not yeah. the entire attic. Pretty close. The, the attic is not very big, 
and the basement is not very big. Uh, they're both, I would call it both, Bob, you would know better than me, both less than 500 square feet. It's, uh, the whole restaurant is not very big. I don't right, know if tiny. fish members have been in, in the restaurant. It is one story restaurant and you could probably fit in a non-COVID situation, seating for 30, in right. a COVID situation, seating for 15. Uh, it's a small restaurant, right. not a lot of room to maneuver. The kitchen is, the first floor kitchen is probably the size of a typical residential kitchen in Darien. And one last item, I'm just looking at the, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals application. It says liquor sales and service shall not be conducted outside the dining. That gets trumped by the current executive order we're in now for COVID. There is no, other than COVID related, no outdoor dining has been approved for this restaurant. Uh, if they do want that in the future, they would have to come back. back here. Okay. Um, that being said, Bob Mazin, um, take it away, sir. Okay, thank you and good evening. My name is Robert Mazin. For the record, I'm the attorney for the applicant. Um, the owner is uh, Tom Anastoglu, and I think on the list is Biagio or Riccio. Uh, his name popped up in one of those little squares. Uh, Tom might be with him uh, in, this, in the same place, participating or watching. Um, I guess they're going to let me do all the talking. Uh, this has uh, been a diner for many, many, many years. It was uh, the old diner was taken out and re and the new diner was rebuilt during the 1990s. Um, and there were a couple of tweaks along the way, but uh, right now uh, we are asking for, uh, as soon as I can figure out how this thing works, just bear with me for a second. Uh, I have an aerial photograph. These, some of these photographs are already in the application papers. Uh, you all know where the, uh, the Driftwood Diner is. Um, yeah. I would just note on this photograph that's up here, it's a Google Earth street view, but we do have some landscaping here on the corner. There's a little, few plantings back here. And off in the distance, I have a closer shot of this that I'll show you in a minute. And then uh, back here, there's also some screening uh, from the adjacent residential properties. This, I took this afternoon. This is a photograph taken along a stockade fence that runs along the common boundary to the north. And on the other side of this fence is um, a residential property. Uh, these are, I think, euonymous, however you say it, fire bushes. Uh, this is a maple tree. There's another tree down the other end. There are some trees that were planted not too long ago uh, along in here, and these get kind of bushy. Uh, they are called pawpaw trees, P-A-W-P-A-W, -W, um, as Tom tells me. Uh, but that's the existing landscaping. And this is different from the landscaping that was on the plans from 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, they had alternate row of evergreens along in this space here. Uh, but this is how this has evolved over the years. And uh, I, it seems to be pretty decent landscaping. With the fence there, you really couldn't see the landscaping from the residential properties anyway. This is from across Richmond Drive, a, a pretty solid green wall from just north of the driveway over to the property boundary. The end of the fence is right about here. And, and this is the um, existing landscaping from Richmond or along Richmond, just looking up toward the uh, south, I guess it's southeast. Uh, the diner building is here and the side entrance is over here. And this is what we're looking for. If I can get this to work. Let's do this. Oh, here we go. The Food preparation area that is in the basement would be 150 square feet. I'll show you a schematic of it. The purpose of this is to provide some space so that one or two of the employees who would otherwise be jammed into the kitchen can work on food prep in the basement um, 
rather than packed into the kitchen. So we're not talking about an increase in the number of kitchen employees or an increase in the intensity of use. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to improve the, the workflow. And uh, this space is kind of, you know, I was thinking about it before you get a, a crate of lettuce out of the refrigerator, you take the enough heads that you need, you might put them on the counter and clean them up a little bit, core them, uh, rinse them out before you bring them upstairs. That's sort of a food prep. And maybe uh, some warming uh, with a, with a, uh, a small a portable oven. The attic space has a 400 square foot space uh, as office. Uh, it may sound like we're trying to build something fancy, but it's really space that you would have a counter and a table and a place for a safe and a computer and monitor and that sort of thing. Uh, just so that the, uh, the owner of the restaurant would have a place to conduct uh, business, keep files and uh, have the safe. The approval of liquor is uh, a little bit of an interesting twist. When this was built back in the 90s, uh, the applicant at that time requested basically site plan approval and a special permit because it's a diner, but at that time did not request liquor. And for that reason, there was conditions put in the variance and planning and zoning decisions that said liquor's not approved. It wasn't a case where they applied for liquor and were denied. They just didn't ask for it. One of the variances they got back in the 90s was a parking variance. That was due to the one space per 50 square foot floor area requirement back then. Now it's one per 100 and we have a few extra spaces and that will support the um, added uh, 400 square feet in the uh, attic level. Uh, the other approvals, as Jeremy mentioned, we went through the Board of uh, Appeals the fire marshal commented and uh, the owner's been talking to the health department and uh, the earlier comments from the health department was they needed a detailed plan and they continue to work on that. It sounds like it's going to be approved. Uh, they need to basically put some partition doors in uh, to separate the food prep from some of the other uh, space. The fire marshal is also looking for detailed plans, which if this is all granted, uh, they'll get those. ARB is not required because there are no facade changes and we're not changing the signage. The um, Biagio might come in and uh, ask for a change in the sign to change it from Driftwood Diner to Organica Cafe, but that, that's a different matter. Um, for historic purposes and to illustrate what the changes are, I have some excerpts from the previously approved plans. This is the site plan. Uh, really no big changes here. The interior floor plan is here. You have a little entry vestibule here with a counter in the cash register, reg restrooms down here. Little display refrigerator case with all the fancy pies and stuff in it. Dining area is over on the left. Kitchen area is here. And this is a uh, stairway from inside the uh, restaurant going up and then there's a corresponding staircase going down but the way into that staircase is through the kitchen side entrance over here uh, this generally is going to remain the same and the kitchen area will remain the same this stairway goes down into the basement uh, for a separate basement entrance obviously not open to the public and back over here with the doorway from the kitchen, this is a uh, trash enclosure. And um, that's kind of what the story is there on the floor plan. Uh, not sure if you're, oh yeah, okay. Um, this is a schematic of the, the entire basement. Uh, these are basically walk-in refrigerators. Stairway comes down into the middle of it. There's a counter here with, refrigeration uh, compressor units uh, right alongside the, the staircase. An oven over here. Eddie was uh, the guy in 2008. Sorry? I'm sorry? The application in 2008 is the current applicant now, right? 
Oh, it's a different guy. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. All right. And so the area we're really talking about for food prep is right in here with uh, a little oven over here. This is a close up of it. It's roughly basically 10 by 15. The sink is installed. There's a sink over here. This is a double sink. Most of the rest of these things are tables on wheels or they're just tables you can pick up and move. So they're not, they're not built-ins. Up on the top level, we have stairway coming up, landing here, pathway to get back to this open space back here where uh, there's a counter. Safe, I think, is over here. There's a couple of filing cabinets and that sort of thing. Nothing really fancy. And I would also note that although this looks like it's taking up a big portion of the second floor, there's a space over here that where the, there's first floor, but no second floor above it. There's a window here with glass in it, but you can actually look down through the window at the front entranceway. So this is really a partial attic level. And uh, we, we, I had them count the landing and the way to get back to the space that uh, would be used for office. Parking, uh, I'm not sure that there's really much of an issue here. Uh, the 1997 uh, approvals showed a basically a 28 space requirement, which would mean the first floor was 1400 square feet or the ground floor. And today, the current requirement is half that. So with 18 parking spaces, uh, we have an extra 400 square feet available uh, because of those additional parking spaces. And then the other thing, if, if you're looking for something to uh, can compare this with, many years ago, and I don't think any of you were on the commission then, but the melting pot, which I'm sure you all have heard of over at Grove Street, uh, is in the first floor of the building on the left. It's actually a full three-story building above ground. When that was approved as Grove Street Plaza, the basements were uh, to be dead storage and the melting pot came along and they were looking for some relief so that they could put some kind of space in the basement for employees. So they came back to the commission and the commission uh, basically helped them out. And I'll show you how that works uh, in a second. Um, That's okay. I mean, we, we know that they have basement space. Go for ice cream's got basement space they use. Okay. And so does um, Brooks Brothers had basement okay. space. So, and huh. Brooks Brothers was a three story building and now it's a two story building. And, and really here you are. I'm just basically running through this. I'll just show you this for the record. This is. Yeah, we're good. The basement space at the melting pot, I, and that's the approval. And it, the approval actually talks about what can be done down there. So that that wraps up the whole thing. So, uh, with Thank respect you. to the landscaping, I just want to touch on that. Jeremy and I looked at it today, and I guess the two of us kind of thought uh, a good way to approach this would be for the owner to work with Woody and the ZBA toward resolving any questions about the landscaping along the residential property, if that's okay with the Planning and Zoning Commission. There is good screening there now, and the owner's willing to pick that up with Arborvitae or spruces or whatever, whatever works. And that's okay. it. So basically, it's an amendment to the existing special permit and uh, site plan. And uh, with that, if you have any questions. Thank you, Bob. Relative to the site plan, all the neighbors were noticed, right? That's correct. Yes. And, and everyone, so everyone knows that this is going on. Yeah. Has it, has, in the last five years, has anyone complained about it like they used to over at um, Anthony's Coal Fire Pizza? No, they, they, I, and when Bob and I were out there today, we talked about in it in the heyday, there were people parked up and down Richmond Drive. Yeah, I used to go there then. Right, and yeah. we haven't had that in a while. The restaurant's been closed for the past few months as they track down this new owner who's going to run a new operation. Great. So uh, we have not had any complaints about this building in at least a couple of years. Okay. 
So, I mean, we're going to open up to the open it up to the public. If anybody in the public is going to speak, they're going to have their chance. If they do live next door, because they were notified. Um, in the file here, this is the 2008 application or 2009 application. Yes. Do, do they have a site plan from 1997 that they keep talking about? Yes, Bob has it in his office. He was showing it to me earlier today, and there were a number of prior approvals, and uh, that's the plan they're going to use to determine what landscaping needs to go in on the northern property line. Okay, so Bob, without objection, I would like to add that site plan to this application. Yeah, if you'll just um, bear with me, I think I can do this. Here you go. Is that the one you, Jeremy? Uh, I'm not sure, Bob. If you think that's the correct one, is that 96, 97, somewhere around there? This is actually 98. It's more recent, and it's in uh, the file special permit 172C. So this is the... Um, yeah, there was a, uh, there was a, the there was a calendar item in 1998. Right. And you can see that that shows a number right. of our properties along that northern property line and some right. other more decorative planting along the west property line along Richmond Drive. Yeah, some of, I mean, this has been the way it shows in the photograph for quite a while now. It, it looks attractive, uh, I think between the stockade fence on the boundary here and the uh, fire bushes along the inside of it. Uh, that's good screening. And as I said, the owner is willing to uh, beef that up with, let's see, these are supposed to be arborvitae um, or Canadian headlocks, I guess. In the orientation, looks like, where's the owner in the rear? Which way is that oriented? Uh, their house faces Richmond Drive. This, yeah, post so roads down at the bottom richmond drives on the left and the residential property is up at the top left corner got it so that double row of bushes on the top of your page that screens the neighbor in the back well if the trees were there it was it's supposed to it's supposed to clean that's correct back. and the zba required that bob the zba required that is that correct the zba said go back to this plan and make it comply there you go there you go so you're and putting that we put a double row of hedges in the back. Yeah, what I what we may do, because there's already something else there, is maybe talk to Woody and possibly go back for a minor modification so that the, it's just effect, just as effective. But it doesn't make sense to pull out what's there and just to put it in there, shown on this okay, plan. That's fine. Of course, staff. Yeah, and that was staff because they have to feel adjusted. There's other things there and we right. have to decide, do they keep those, what's there? Do they move it? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna focus on our application, which is the three items. Yep, they okay. just meant the attic and the liquid. Okay. I mean, one so, way to do it, Steve, would be to just leave it up to the owner and the staff and the ZBA to work out the landscape. That's what Jeremy and I was just talking about. Yep. Yes, agreed. Um, so your application is the variance for the, I mean, the basement use, for, for fruit property, it's probably going to make salads. The upstairs for the guy to have an office so he can count whatever he right. does upstairs on the top floor. And then right. the liquor, liquor okay. sales. So it relative to, my, to, to me, and we'll open up to, to the rest of the commissioners, obviously, is, um, it, I mean, they all seem reasonable. The building's been closed for a while if they need more space, but there's no more chairs being added to the, oh. there were tables, there's no more chairs, there's no more seating. There's no change in use of the restaurant. Right. Okay, got it. Um, okay, I'm good. Would anybody in the, um, any commission like to speak to this application? Uh, Carrie, your mic's open. You want to talk first at all? I guess I just would like to understand better from Attorney Maslin. You know, you had to go to ZBA first, which you did, correct? Yes. Yeah, we have the resolution. I said they approve certain things and required stipulations and now it seems like you want to go back to them why didn't you do that at that time before you came to us well the landscaping was i don't want to use the word afterthought but i that might be the first one that comes to mind it was only about the landscaping we had a brief conversation during the, the hearing about the landscaping that really didn't get drilled down uh to the point where we thought the commission would or the board would require something 
more than what was already there. Um, and then after they uh, drafted their memorandum, uh, they just have a blanket requirement to go back and get this 1998 plan uh, and comply with it. But we have things that are planted along that fence that it doesn't make sense to, to remove in order to put Canadian hemlocks there. So uh, it, it's kind of a work it out with the, with the staff more than going back to the ZBA. But as far as the rest of the approvals, um, there's no issue with those. It's just, it's just satisfying the ZBA that we're, we're providing the right amount of landscaping. But I, I think the bottom line point is that the landscaping today is pretty good in the rear. Yeah, no one's grown through them. There's uh, there was a maple tree there that's grown up such yeah, that you couldn't put an arbor vitae there. It's where the maple tree is. We're talking about something that's 22 years ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In 22 I, years, I, things. I'm sorry why it was brought up then. Like it was brought up for a reason. We didn't bring it up, right? Who brought it up? ZBA or us? ZBA. Yeah. Right. So. And, and procedurally, do you have to go through ZBA before you can see, you know, seek our approval? Yeah. You know, this is interesting because this is not a new variance. It's an amendment to an existing variance. Mm. Okay, so, that's really, not really answering my question. You know, and then you, this is, again, for you, this is not a new site plan or a new special permit. It's an I amendment to, to an existing one. I know, but I asked procedurally, do you have to get ZBA approval before you can come to us? That was sort of my question. Uh, I don't think so. Steve, it's for the attorney. Yeah, but it, to Jeremy's answering and his microphone's it's muted. It's not Jeremy's application. <laughs> right? no, in terms of procedural, they have to I think, ZBA, he's, I think it's Jeremy's that can answer the question. You know, we're telling you what the procedure is. Okay, what is it? Okay, tell me. That they go to ZBA before right. they come to us. Right. They usually, so they usually do go to ZBA that. first anyway. Right. But, and so now are we going to be going around in circles? No. Okay. I just don't want to be wasting no. people's time. No, no. You're not wasting anybody's time. Okay. I know I'm not. <laughs> I'm just making sure this process is okay. Have to go to ZBA and come back to us. Otherwise, I think the the special application and the site plan, you know, as long as we're in compliance, you know, you're, it's in compliance with what ZBA says, I'm favorable towards it. But I want to make sure that we're respectful to other boards and that we're complying with them before we jump ahead to other, you know, the next board. No, we're, we're I think we're, we're fine. We're, I think the, the plan now is for us to work with Woody and Jeremy and just make sure the landscape is that that's really all it is. Okay, George Riley, your mic is open. Yeah, my my question. Speaking of time, is uh, time of uh, uh, liquor sales, Bob? Um, will you be selling as whenever the state permits you to, or uh, and I don't even know all those rules, but lunch, dinner, the whole like that. Well, if I can step back a second there are hours already in place from the previous planning and zoning and zba approvals and uh they will remain in place the liquor control commission has hours i guess you know you can't serve prior to a certain time and after a certain time at night and you know i i think the hours of operation are uh well inside the hours that at least at night when uh, liquor can be sold. So uh, is that- what well, you're gonna require through existing times? Cause I thought there was no application for liquor sales previously. And there was just a determination that you will not sell, but nobody asked to sell, right? We didn't, right. That question was asked and the answer was, we're not asking for it. The reason, so the reason it's in, in the, the reason it's mentioned, George is, it, ordinarily, the zoning enforcement officer would sign a sign off on the location uh, when an applicant applies for a liquor permit. Plus, well, there's a condition of record saying no liquor, that prevents the uh, zoning enforcement officer from signing off on the location. So that it served that purpose, but it, that that's really about it. So th this, I think, is 
the plan is this will be a diner open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Is that right? Well, it's a um, organic. What did he say? Organic vegan type. <laughs> That's place. if the new tenant. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. Ken's gonna go there. Okay. Who? Uh, Jennifer. Uh, okay. Correct. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Uh, and drink liquor. All right, so you got a plan on serving liquor at lunch and dinner, I guess, right? Yes. Well, I guess okay. that's a good question, George. I don't. So what's that? So they had a beer and wine license, right? Now they have liquor. They're open from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Do we know what what those hours are, Bob? For the liquor? There are none. No, serving among the staff. I think we're talking state compliance. Oh, state the compliance. State, okay. yeah. That's state not compliance. us. That's fine. Okay. But but obviously, if if the special permit says you have to close by midnight, you can't stay open till one o'clock because the state allows you to sell liquor until one. Correct. Yeah, yes. I mean the hours of operation are here: six a.m. to eleven p.m. and six a.m. to midnight. Yes. Yep. And that's oh, okay. and it, you know. can we rely on that because that's that's now a closed business, isn't it? But it's it's a condition for this site. And when it's you grant it, if you right. approve this, there's always a line in the approval that says all previous conditions remain the same. That's like when, okay. when, we, when we I did, haven't seen reference to that. Remember when we did the barbershop? The barbershop specifically had no liquor and then it got turned to a liquor store. That's where they had to lift that at the barbershop. Larry Warwell, any questions, sir? Yeah, can you just walk me through uh, why originally the, the parking only needed 17 instead of 28 spaces? Sure. When this was built, there were 17 spaces. That's all they had room for. The zoning regulations at that time required one space for every 50 square feet of floor area. So with a 1400 square foot floor area, in order to comply, you needed 28 spaces. So they applied for a variance to reduce the parking requirement from 28 to 17. A few years ago, the commission reduced the parking requirement from one space for every 50 square feet to one space for every 100 square feet, which cuts the parking requirement in half. And I'm not sure where it came from, but there's 18 spaces out there now. And uh, that gives us uh, basically 400 square feet of finished space that we can add, and that's what's up in the attic. Uh, so we're confident that we've got the parking on the site. Yes, so it complies. In Richmond Road and going up in there. Right, parking. Chair. Uh, yeah, I somebody asked about complaints. I don't think there's been complaints in a long time. I, looking in the file, there were complaints while this was being built and shortly after it was built. But uh, it seemed that things calmed down quite a bit since then. Well, yeah, but it's also you've got a few other diners in the area, and this is going to be, you know, maybe the, the diner traffic. And there's a reason they got why, why they went out of business, right? People weren't going there, so they didn't need to park. Well, this uh, was this. If, if, if seniority means anything, business. if seniority means anything, this is the first diner that was there compared to all the rest of them. I, Actually, I think, I think what means yeah. anything is where people decide to go to eat. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yep. You know, that's that's where I'm going with. I mean, there's no complaints if there's, you know, no one's really using the place. No one's going to complain. I'm just I, I, I'm I'm just letting you know to be transparent. Yeah, uh, I live in the neighborhood up above that. And yeah, if a lot of cars start parking on there, that's something that's that that that's a concern to me. And I just want to make sure that it's covered. There's no parking at which room. OK. Yeah, there's no parking signs on Richmond Road, Larry. Oh, okay. So you can't go there. So if you can't park at the new Driftwood Diner, whatever it's going to be called, you got to go to Darien Diner, which is the old premise. 
of the block. Yeah. Okay, that's, 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 that's pretty much covers that for me then. Thank you. Yeah, but if you go up there, you have to eat bacon and eggs. If you want something organic, you can go here. Right, that's yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, now we're going to get the VW microbuses and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, Jennifer's going to be there. And She's eating her doesn't mean I drive a VW. Uh, all those, all those bumper stickers and yeah. At least they'll be hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George. All right, let's keep it short. We are all, we're time. all showing our age. Hey, George. Yes. I think I'm with you, Bob. Um, he, that being said, I think we got everything, so we'll open up to the general public. Um, would anybody in the general public like to speak to this application? And if you see anybody, let me know. I don't have anybody in the chat box. Nothing, right, Fred? You're muted. I don't see anything. Okay. All right. Yeah, that being, no we're good. Thank you, sir. Um, okay. That being said, we're, we're focused on the three items. No one has an issue with your three items. Obviously, the liquor permit is subject to state control. If you get it from the from the state board, uh, you're welcome. The attic seems minor and the basement seems minor. So with that being said, I would entertain a motion to close this hearing. Uh, George Riley and Larry's going to second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you, Jim Rand. All righty. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Yep, you're welcome. Ready to move it on. What next? Uh, okay, next we have um, Postal Site Plan Review number. 129B is a boy, flood damage prevention application number 127B is a boy, Jeffrey Beringer at 36 Beach Drive, proposed to install a spa, trellis, fire pit, and an at grade terrace, and to perform related site development activities within regulated areas. The 0 0.3436 plus minus acre subject property is located on the west side of Beach Drive approximately 200 feet south of the intersection with Outlook Drive and is shown on assessor's map number 53 as lot number three and four in the R1 half zone. Jeremy, what do we got? Sure, in this case, uh, you have a spa, seven by seven spa in the flood zone. This is a property uh, almost at the end of Beach Drive as you're driving down on the right-hand side. It's a very small lot and the house is uh, kind of uh, too far into the pipeline setback. We're putting the spa behind the existing garage, the fire pit to the side of it, adding some new terrace area and a pergola. All the work is in the cam area and the flood zone. Uh, because the property is right on Holly Pond, they required review and action by the Environmental Protection Commission for work within 100 feet of Holly Pond. That was granted on September 3rd. You have a copy of that letter in your packet. But basically, it's a, a number of improvements in the backyard and to the side of the garage. Uh, but you can see, looking at the survey on the screen, uh, the way the house sits on the property, uh, I think the entire property is in the flood. So uh, they're going to have some fences and landscaping. In this case, the Zoning Board of Appeals also approved the project last Wednesday. I believe you have a copy of their draft approval in your packets. Uh, which talks a little bit about some of the conditions of approval relative to the landscaping and fencing. Um, if there's anything else, uh, Sean Walters from Wagner Pools is here to answer any questions you may have about the application. Basically, the pool, the spy equipment will be elevated on a platform and um, that's about it. It's uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, not a very long construction project because uh, again, it's not a big pool. It's a seven by seven spa. It's on Holly Pond. We're really seeing it. Thank you. Yes. Very okay. it's right on Holly Pond. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have Sean Walters from Wagner Pool. Is that correct? Is that That's correct. Uh, thank you, PNC, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeremy. You, the floor is yours, uh, sir. Okay, so what we have here is, uh, can you guys see my screen? Perfect. Fantastic. 
So what we have here is a, uh, it's an interesting situation. Uh, Beach Drive in the front of the house, there is a 65 foot front yard setback, uh, which actually uh, ends up being in the rear yard of the property, uh, given the small lot size. And as Mr. Ginsburg stated, Holly Pond, which is in the rear yard, uh, has an upland review line, which is actually in the front yard. So the entire project area is located within a sort of a gray area between overlapping setback constraints. Uh, so we did obtain a ZBA approval for that uh, last week. And uh, you know, among other things, what we have is a trellis that's gonna be attached to the back of the garage, which uh, would be this area here. So the street is on the other side of the garage. So it's completely hidden. The spa is located in this alcove between the garage and the sunroom, uh, also hidden. And uh, we're proposing some uh, stepping stones with turf joints, dry laid stepping stones. And we have a, also a, uh, a raised fire pit, which matches the footprint of the spa. Uh, and that would be right here. Uh, and basically uh, some plantings and a privacy fence. And uh, as the board is aware, uh, you know, there is no view shed easement in effect for this area. So uh, we did not feel that a six foot height fence was uh, interrupting or, or causing any issues for the neighbors. In fact, we've received uh, a letter of approval from one late neighbor and no complaints from any of the others. Uh, and uh, that's really about it. Uh, we are in, in located uh, uh, the equipment pad and the AC units, which are going to be moved, will be uh, relocated and on pads at elevation 14 according to the uh the flood zone that we're in which would be uh ae 14. so some good comes out of that also just in the moving of the units uh, we get everything uh compliant with current regulations and and uh current uh fema flood zone and uh, that's it thank you when's the skateboard half pipe coming out that is already gone. Um, okay. Hang on, let me. Uh, I did not go back there. Well, <laughs> so I actually took a picture of that this uh, previous uh, two Mondays ago prior to the meeting. And um, I wanted to show this actually for Woody. Um, Give me just a second here. Uh, the, the half pipe is actually gone. Um, okay. That's fine. It, it, it's been replaced with the trampoline, which is definitely a movable structure. Uh, we're in the process of updating our server right now. I apologize, but uh, I do have photographic documentation of that. That's fine. That's fine. Jeremy, you just want to go over the um, letter from Darren Ostefine, if you sure. might. Sure. One thing I neglected to mention um, earlier was. The commission in its packets has an October 7, 2020 memo from Assistant Director of Public Works, Darren Ostefine, uh, noting that uh, the site is directly adjacent to Holly Pond, uh, connected to public water and sewer. And uh, they did, uh, because of the minor amount of work, uh, Mr. Walters is requesting a stormwater waiver. They're not putting in a lot of new impervious surface, the right on Holly Pond. So they're asking for a waiver of uh, any stormwater requirement for stormwater management. We're putting in stepping stone pavers, which are, have open space in between them, which is grass. Right. Seven by seven spot and the fire pit, a little trellis water, which is fence. So it's a reasonable request. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, would any of the commissioners like to speak to this application? Uh, I'm sure thank, you. thank you, Jim. I'm okay. Jennifer's okay. Jennifer's okay. George Ray, you look like you're okay. And Kara Gately looks like she's okay. Um, okay. Everyone's fine. Kara, you're good, right? Yep. Um, would anyone in the general population like to speak to this application? Kara? And Fred, you're going to check the chat, see if anybody's there. Okay. 
So we're going to put in a trellis in the backyard, some some paving, some pavers, um, three by three pavers, a spa outside part of the back, and a fire pit, and then some additional new landscaping and lighting. That's good. Anything I missed? That's it. All right. With that said, I would enter a motion to close. George, can you make that motion? There we go. Motion from George. A second from. Second from. Thank you, Jennifer. Second from Jennifer. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will deliberate your um, application in a couple of weeks. Got all your resolutions and whatnot. I mean, your um, ZBA and your EPC. So you should make your payment. Thank, Thank you, you. Good night. Right along. Uh, I got one left, I think. 97 pitch is the last public area. Here we go. Landfilling and re application number 488, Terrence and Terrence, uh, Firewitch and Linda Nyback. Ni uh, I apologize, folks. Um, 97 Fitch Avenue proposal to recreate the western portion of the property to accommodate a new patio and to perform related site development activities within, including the construction of a retaining wall and installation of storm water management. The 0 0.25 plus or minus acre property is located on the west side of Fitch Avenue at the northwest corner. At the northwest corner formed. By the intersection with Boston Post Road and the Stroman Assessors Map Number 42 at Slot 8 in the R one third zone. Uh, Jerry, what do we got? Sure, you commission members, you might have been past this property or drawn driven past it. It's a new house currently under construction at the corner of Fitch Avenue and Boston Post Road. This application is for regrading, especially along the front, and I'll call it the west side of the property between the house and what is the fire station right there on the post road. Andy Sumalides is here uh, from Lantec to discuss grading, drainage, some of the fencing, uh, the revised plan you have before you takes into it, has been modified, is the modified version, which uh, gives special attention to the street intersection near Fitch and Boston Post Road making sure that's clear and meets the sight line requirements. We also have limits on four foot fences in the front yard, both along Boston Post Road and along Fitch Avenue. The revised plan reflects that four foot max fence height. And Andy's gonna talk you a little bit through uh, what the plan's all about in terms of grading drainage. Uh, I think at most there's three feet, of, three feet of fill in the largest part. I spoke to Mr. Filowich last week who said that at most it's one new truckload coming in, that the amount of dirt they have on site is pretty close to the correct amount. So I'll let Andy take it away from here and walk you through the plans a little bit. So this is the new house that's right next to the fire station that's basically finished construction. Pretty yes, tall, 12 feet correct. high. It's like two and a half stories and the ground floor is, is 12 feet high. That's correct. Um, we spoke about this house just for a matter of reference when um, we did the the approval of um, oh, Mr. Vicar's project, which is the old Darien International Tower. Um, and who's representing us tonight? Andy Sumalides from Lantac. Thank you. Andy Sumalides, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, you're muted right now, but your thing doesn't say mute. I can't hear me. Make him hit that testing your microphone. Yeah, it, it appears that Andy is is unmuted. I'm not sure what's happening here. Um, Andy, do you want me to call you on your on my phone? Put my iPhone up. We can hear you now, Andy. Uh, yeah, that's you, Andy. That feedback. Can you hear me? 
want to call in or you want Terrence to present it? Um, Mr. Filowicz, do you want to give, um, want to present it? Um, while Andy's um, going, going through the dial-in, do you want to do that, Andy? If he goes through the dial-in, it's okay. Can you hear me okay? Andy, if you, what you can do is you can, um, yeah, mute your computer and then call it on your cell phone. If you have to call my cell phone, that's fine. I can put you on speaker on my cell phone. Him? No, he's muted. That's Fred. And do you have a cell phone handy? Just nod your head. There you go. Just call my cell phone. Just call it to his. You guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, very good. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. All right, so a Andy's caller, too. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, for the record, Andy Simulidi, uh partner and professional engineer with Landtech out of Westport. Um, Fred, do you mind if I could share my screen? I can walk you guys through this site plan. Uh, yeah, one second, Andy. Sure. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right, perfect. So this property is on the corner of Fitch Ave and Boston Post Road. Um, this is was the original house um, and an original property. This house was tore down um, and rebuilt. As you can see, the, the property grades from north to south um, pretty consistently down to the Boston Post Road with a grade of 104 near the north and about 96 as you get down to the Boston, Boston Post Road. Um, this is our site plan that is approved and currently under construction. Um, so it's a new single family residence, um, entrance off of Fitch Ave, the proposal originally called for some landscaping along the front, um, along Boston Post Road, um, and then a patio in the rear. And if you, if you take a look at this patio, um, you come out the, the back of the house, down a set of stairs to this um, elevated patio that's less than three feet from grade. On the north end, as um, I mentioned earlier, is the higher side of the site, so that's at grade. There's a three foot high retaining wall and another stair set of staircase that gets you down to grade here behind the garage. Um, and then the, the site slopes down to Boston Post Road. So you have about a, an elevation of 100 here down to 96. Um, and this kind of limits our restraints. And this is why we're here tonight um, with this 15 foot um, rear grading of the patio, which has, which limits uh, if we did a patio at grade here, it would slope tremendously. So under our new proposal, what we're looking to do is really elevate this area and make it a, a full at grade patio. Um, you can see it's just one staircase now that gets you down to a full uh, patio. And then this patio is all at grade. Um, in order to achieve this, we're looking to add a retaining wall along the west side of the property that we abut the firehouse here. Um, so in, in, as Jeremy mentioned, in the worst case, I think it's about three feet. Um, at this point here, you know, even with the garage here is where we're probably at grade with the 
um, the firehouse and, and beyond that, we're basically going to be at grade um, filling in at this section. We, we do show a wall if there is a little bit of wall needed, but we feel that right in this area, we're going to pretty much be at grade. So here is you have about a three foot wall um, down to basically no wall and at grade. We're going to continue a wall along the front face here of the property. Um, and that this all became a result of, you know, we put the house was a modular home. And after we set the house and really saw the site, the owners came back and were like, you know, we need some more usable space and we want more screening. Um, so it was basically a function of those two prop, those two things, um, this additional fill. So it gives you a more usable space back here, a cleaner edge here. There is a rubble um, wall there now that's, you know, in pretty bad shape and disrepair. We'll basically be fixing this entire length of wall. Um, the firehouse also has a wall Engineer. along their frontage. So, so we basically continue that along the frontage of Boston Post Road as well. Um, this would also elevate this section and have our plantings to be higher and provide more screening from the Boston Post Road. Um, that pretty much in a nutshell is what we're looking to do with this, you know, landfilling application. The drainage patterns remain the same. Um, we did add a, a trench drain along this back edge, uh, along the back edge of the patio. So any flow that falls off the back, sh that she flows off the patio will get picked up to minimize any runoff there. But we also feel like we can achieve this by this eight foot section of grade where we can cr create a swale like scenario where she flow would continue. Um, but we also, for you know, belts and suspenders per se, added this trench drain along the back edge to prevent any runoff um, to a, that would go onto the firehouse property. The Marine Bear property would still continue to sheet flow as it did in our previous approval and even before we started developing the property. Um, as our previous approval, we did add a new drainage system, um, which picks up all the roof runoff from the house, the driveway, and now it would include this patio into this drainage system. Um, and I think that in a nutshell, I, I think Jeremy alluded to the, the sight line triangle. So there'll be no plantings within that sight line triangle. And also um, I'll show you street view here. Um, this is the firehouse. This is that retaining wall. This is the site here right in front of you where you see that excavator. We'd continue this wall along the front edge um, up until we're allowed to with that sight line triangle and then plant arborvitaes above it. So if you continue past, you see what this corner looks like. Um, not, you know, very similar to what you see here, a wall with arborvitaes to provide screening. Um, so that in a nutshell is what we're looking to do uh, with our piece of property and obviously adhere to the sight line triangles that we need to for zoning purposes. Any questions? Thank you, Thank you. Andy. Just tell me how you're gonna make the wall because I think the wall is holding back some dirt um, in that upper corner, right? So I'm, I'm concerned with the wall is, the top of the wall is, is three feet, five inches or 103.5 and the bottom of the wall is 101.4. Correct. It's not tall, but you know, is it holding back anything on the other side? You're digging into the side of the hill, right? You're right so there. This is it unit is it unit block? Is it an engineered wall? What are you doing? No, no. So it's less than three feet. Um, so it's basically a mortared stacked wall. Um, is what this wall will be. The grade here, as you can see, this is 104 up here. Yep. Um, and the property here is at 101.4. So kind of naturally right now, it they're slightly lower. So what we'd like to do is, and then there is a wall there now, and it's kind of in, in disrepair. So it's essentially creating a nice clean edge along this property line with a new mortar um, stone wall. Do you put steel in that wall too? No. Okay, so it's a concrete mortar and stone. Is it concrete mortar or is it just? It's a stone masonry wall with mortar joints. Got it, okay. Yep, uh, and what we'd look to do is um, it's not really part of this application, or I, I guess since it's on our plan and it's a modification to our previous site plan, is is we would like to add 
fencing on top of that wall also for screening purposes. But that's not part of the special permit. Right, and that's allowed to be what, two feet high? Yeah, I've gone through with Andy very specifically on how tall the, the fence on top of the wall can be. There's a provision in the regs that you next to a special permit use, like a fire station, you can have an eight foot high wall. Okay. So I think here, I spoke to Andy about it because originally Andy it was taller and we've since cut it down, correct? Correct. Yeah, it was eight feet here, but we had eight feet also in the front setback, which we changed to four feet. Right. Okay. So you can see here we're, we're we're within 30 feet of the front setback. It changes from an eight foot to a four foot. Right. My I just my neighbors just did that. So in the back, in the back corner, is it effectively 10 feet? Because you're two feet high and you're going, or it's three feet high and you're going eight feet on top of it. It's yes. Um. Yeah. I mean, our existing grade here. So you, well, our grade is already slightly higher than um, the firehouse currently. Um, so that's why I keep saying there's this wall there that's in disrepair. Our grade here is 102, where I'm pointing at the existing grade. And the grade down here for the firehouse is 100.96, so 101 effectively. So we're already a foot or so higher in this section and almost a foot and a half in this corner, where we're looking to be, you know, 2.1 feet higher. So we're not really grading much in this section in terms of um, adding fill. The predominant fill set package is, you know, as you get down in here, where we're at 100, and we really want to raise it to 103. Um, but so I'm here's asking more about the height, where height, height, height of the wall. Excuse me? I'm asking about the height of the, the wall, the fence on top of the wall in total. Yeah, so effectively on our side, you'd have an eight foot wall. Um, on the firehouse side, you'd see a two foot reveal of wall and then an eight foot high fence on it. So on the firehouse firehouse side, yes, you'll see it as a 10 foot section. On the residential side, it'd only be a 10 foot high, uh, eight foot high fence. Uh, the reveal is on the firehouse. We're higher than the firehouse. We're higher than the fence, but so it's still going to be it's still going to be 11 feet on your side too, right? No, it'll be eight feet on their side. So we're at great on our side and, staring and on this side lower wood fence kind of like the room we're in right now like eight feet from that great that's what you're going to be looking at okay because i'm just concerned about the name of but it's allowed in the special permit adjacent because we have you have the mu zone next to you which is special permit with the firehouse and that's to the firehouse garage that's right right what about the guy behind him uh, on the oh, north guy. side of the property uh they're yeah. only allowed us uh, they're not showing sure. I got you. So the we're not, we're not proposing. I got it. Okay. I'm good. I understand what you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Um, any commissioners have questions on this one? If you do, just raise your hand. You'll be recognized. Uh, George, Ray, everybody's good. Uh, Jim Rain, you okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we, we covered it, right, Jeremy? I mean, I get it. We're just talking about the patio over here in the wall. Yeah, it's going to be great for that whole west side. They're taking out a bunch of dirt, but it's here. Right? Is anyone in the public um, domain want to speak to this application? Fred, just keep your eye on out there, please. <laughs> no, we don't have anyone to see it. I think it's just us commissioners left. All righty. Um, we have no questions from the commission. We have no questions from the general public. Andy, I think you did a good job once you got online. So your um, client should be very happy. Um, I would enter a motion to close. Um, Jennifer, I mean, Kara or George, you want to make that motion? Motion. Uh, I think we have a motion made by George and seconded by Jennifer. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, all in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Great. Hi. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. Good job. Thank you all. Have a good night. We'll get a decision two in two or three weeks in front of Jeremy. Oh, do we want to go over to this? Darren asked the first thing. Well, I would just note that it's part of the record. Okay. okay. Great. Make it mask.
All right, next up, um, that is the end of the public hearings. What time do we have? Um, quarter 10? We're doing okay, right? Yep. We're everybody good? Um, time permitting, deliberation possible decision on the following. Oh, I think so. Um, we have I got it right here. Okay. Yeah. I got it. Um, next up, we have a draft resolution. Um, Coastal Spain Payment Review Number 232A, Plan Damage Prevention Application Number um, 260A, Land Filling and Regrading Application Number 205A, Kyle and Elizabeth Kehoe at 88 Near Water Lane. This is the site that is at the corner of Near Water Lane and um, and Juniper and Juniper Road, I think. Is that uh, no, it's right? a long driveway off of, of a near Juniper. water. Well, where the heck is that? Back into the woods, an existing brown Finger. house that's signed to be demolished. Right, but and I, it takes the trees out around the house. Yeah, but you get out of Juniper. It's on the corner of Juniper. Oh, okay, whatever. Um, this resolution was on our agenda last week. It got pulled for a couple little revisions. Um, you want to go through what changes you made? Sure, you I, can, I can go through. Um, the, the draft resolution you have is dated October 20th, which is today. We certainly changed the dates from the October 13th, uh, which was the prior. Uh, we talked a little bit about on finding number two was added, uh, which talks about the existing residence is below the flood elevation, the new residence will have a first floor of 16.3 plus, which will comply with the flood regulations. We'll have a crawl space, flood vents, no basement because it's in the flood zone. All the HVAC units will be at or above elevation 15. We felt that was important to incorporate that in the resolution. Um, we also put on, I think in, what else was, in going to the conditions of approval in paragraph G, we clarified in G2 that it's an as-built survey is being required, so we can certify that everything meets the flood regulations. Um, I thought we included the, yeah, the other you know, we eliminated the requirement for a disconnect from sewer services since they're already on septic. They don't need that. Um, that's pretty much covers the changes. Okay. Not too extensive. Now, one of my questions too, wasn't this the application where they're taking the septic system and making that part of the water Storm retention? Water. Yes, correct. Okay. That's covered in uh, condition I. Okay, so I want to add something about that relative to in number five. Yep. It was noted that there's no not presently stormwater management on the site, and something about the septic system will be re reused. Yes, we can include that there. And this is where the the, the problem comes. Um, where is it? Then uh, it gets crushed. Uh, where is it? I thought, I thought it was in here. I thought it came up to it said that the septic system is going to get, yeah, there you go. As noted in second order, uh, no processing crushing or gravel. I thought it said something about the old septic system was going to get crushed. Well, they need, in condition I, it talks about a demolition permits needed from the building department, along with health department approval to abandon and reuse the existing on site. Okay, got it. All right, that's fine. Um, and the only other thing is that, uh, is there a special permit for this? Because on, on the last one, it says a special permit form and notice of drain of drain drainage management plan shall be filed. Yes, because of the, of the regrading aspects. So the, the special, special permit. permit. Okay, but it doesn't say special. Yeah, well, what we've, we've officially done is when we say landfilling, it's a special permit. Um, 
And the only other quote unquote typo I have, if it is a typo or not, um, on the bottom of page four, it, talk, it talks about the Asbelt survey, then the next sentence says the Asbelt survey, then the last time it says the Asbelt shall include measurements. Oh, let's look at the word survey. Bingo, that's it. All right. Anybody else have any questions or comments or Scribner's errors on this one? George, you're usually good for something. No? <laughs> I tried hard, but I couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> Jennifer's shaking her head no. Mary's smiling. Kara would say something if she had an issue. And Jim Rand sounds like he's probably okay. Okay. Uh, with no. that, with those couple minor changes, we're going to add a little bit to um, number five about reusing the septic system and add the word survey to number uh, G2. That would be the edit. So I enter a motion to approve as edited. George, you make that motion? Thank you, sir. Sure. I want a second. Jen, raise your hand. I'll second. second. Yeah. Jim Rand. Jim Rand to the game. Jim Rand seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Done. Okay, that's done. The next thing we have, um, the next thing on our agenda is let's get to, um, instead of doing the deliberations on this public hearings, um, let's do the committee report or do you want to do the um, approval minutes first? Um, it's up to you. Yeah, can we just blow through the minutes first and then we'll turn the floor over to the subcommittee? Is that all right? All right. Um, the minutes this should be kind of easy. September 22nd. It was the minutes from September 22nd. We had the, um, this is the first 7 Eleven one that they went into, um, which was the main item. And the back end, we have a resolution we can't change anyway. Um, one of the items that I had, just maybe this is true, maybe it's not true. Um, on page two of the minutes, it talks about a, a 4,050 square foot building. And then they say it's 3,600 square feet for the, for the convenience store and 465 for the um, restaurant use. That It's a math error. If that's what they said, that's what they said, but it's a math error. Because 360 plus 265 equals 4065. Uh, what else? Um, and is this correct? On page four, um, it's talking about Michael Galante. He said that based on their analysis, the proposal would generate a total increase of 143 and 119 new vehicle trips during the day in the morning, week and afternoon. Is that an increase from what Duchess is doing? Yes. So it's an increase from what Duchess is doing to what's gonna be proposed. Can we just add that from Duchess? Oh, from, from the existing. Yeah, from an increase from the existing use to there. Yep. I thought it was a total number. Um, okay. Where is that? Where is it? Where is that? Uh, first paragraph on page four. First, first full paragraph on page four, about 10 lines down. It says, he said that based on their analysis, the proposal would generate a total increase of 143 and 119 new vehicle trips during weekday mornings and week and weekday afternoon peak hours respectively so that's an, an increase of the based on the existing use so for argument's sake if the existing uses have 100 trips it's going to increase by 143 that means they have 243 that's all I'm saying. If it's got 300, it's 350. Just that, double check that. Just double check that. That seems that seems high. No, 143 divided by the number of hours in the peak in the peak time period. That's like usually like an hour. That's a lot of cars in one hour. So either you have to increase of what it is, or take out the word increase. Okay. 
That's one or the other. Okay, that's it for me. Anybody else have anything on these minutes? I had nothing. I had nothing. Okay. I actually didn't have these minutes in my packet, so I will have to review them. I hope they're online. It's it came. Online. It came last week, so you didn't get a double copy. It was in the week oh, prior. So okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, all right, so I would annotation most to approve as amended. Did I amend anything? I didn't change anything. Right? So I, didn't, I didn't change anything. We just double check it. So as as submitted in draft. George, you good? Would Larry want to make that motion? George? Larry makes the motion, and who's going to second? George, second? Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carrie, you're abstaining? If I don't have them, I can read them. I can't really put them. I got you. That's fine. That's fair. Sorry, man. It's kind of Thank like a technical issue. Uh, next is the September 29th minutes. Did you have these, Karen? Yeah, I was not at this meeting. Oh. It's the day my dad died. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I'll be fixed. Uh, rules, um, the guy Dan Kowalski from the Rotten Presbyterian is he a doctor? Not that no. I'm okay, well, for some reason, I thought it was Dr. Dan. Um, oh, uh, no, yeah, this is it. This is where it comes up. Then, if you go to these minutes, I knew I saw it 88 near Water Lane. That's the one that we just approved. Two seconds ago, yep. if you go to page two, about 15 lines up from the bottom, he said the existing septic system would be would be crushed and a new house would be connected to the sewer line. So if you're crushing the existing septic system in the minutes, how are you reusing it in the in the resolution? I'll double check. Right, because I knew they were reusing it, so something's. Maybe they're, they're well, it could be that they're using the tank, but not the other pieces. Okay. That's fine. I, I, I knew there was a connection there. So I knew it at some point. Um, that, um, and the other thing I want to note to the commissioners, if you look on page four of six, about the other page, the commission recently discussed zone of quarter who's denying this guy. The commission members suggested to potentially modify the zoning record to allow this to occur in the future. I think we are going to talk about that, and this might relate to what Jim Rand's going to talk about later or the subcommittee. That to me is an ADU, it's an accessory dwelling unit. Because that guy could have built an apartment above his garage, and that would have been the second house. Um, so we are going to try to address that. Um, I think that's it for me. Anybody else have any questions to these minutes? Questions, comments, scrivener's errors? Oh, okay. So this we have George Riley, Jennifer, um, Jim Rand, and Steve. I think we we, we did not have um, Larry, or Larry or Kara. So I take a motion to approve from one of those three people. Larry, you good? But well, George Riley made his motion and Jennifer seconded. All in favor? Hi. Hi. Great. Thank you, Jim. Those are done. Okay, next, new minutes. October 13th. Um, this is the Darien Library, the new woman that was there the first time. Then we have, uh, we talked about 7th Sedgwick, which is the um, Old Bank of America building. We talked about three parklands. Uh, my other question to this was we talked about the number of units, inclusive of 52 units. Is that we left off on? Is that right? Numbers right? I guess I would be yeah, right. In page three, we have the resolution. We can't touch that. Um, after that, we have another resolution, which is on page seven. We can't we change that. Um, on page 12, we have another resolution. We can't change that. Any lane, we have another resolution on page 16. We can't change that. Then the bottom, we have the subcommittee report on possible legislation. Is this everything that the subcommittee said? 
because uh, we're going to talk about it again. And then we close the meeting. That's all I have, which is nothing. Um, anybody else have any questions, comments on these minutes? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve from either uh, care was that at this meeting? That's correct. Okay. Chad, are you making a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? Yes, she is. And then Larry Warble seconded. All those in favor? Jim Rand, say aye. Five to zero. Got it. Aye. Aye. <laughs> You're killing me. That's awesome. All right, the minutes are done. All right. Next up, we have subcommittee report on possible legislation. I would like to turn this over to the subcommittee, which consists of Larry Warble, Jennifer Leahy, and Jim Rand. Take it away, subcommittee. Oh, <laughs> I don't know whether Jennifer or Larry want to volunteer. Um, <laughs> uh, where, where's? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go. We yeah, well, you, you, you can do it, Jim. Yeah. We're we're running, we're we're struggling with this a little bit, uh, uh, and we're behind our time. Um, what I propose, I mean, we're, I, I think generally we're coming to the view that um, if you consider everything that we've read among the three or four proposed laws, uh and as well as what's been published or written by various and sundry uh, interested parties what they're doing is they're transmitting they're transferring the authority of the local zoning board to the state um and i mean there's a lot in it that uh i think we have issues with uh, but the overriding issue is they're taking the authority away from where it's where it is at present which is in the municipality and um uh transferring it to the state a state's not taking the zoning actions the state is simply proposing to uh say what the zoning rules are and we're supposed to in the municipalities uh, zoning commission is just supposed to toe the line. Um, uh, what we are going to try to do uh, to put this to bed is to get together uh, probably sometime tomorrow, uh, draft up a, uh, a memo to the commission uh, and uh, give some thought as to what should be in a letter drafted along the along the general lines of uh, of what Richfield did and get it in the hands of the full uh, uh, zoning commission for everybody to consider and think about and make suge suggestions to so that uh, if we're happy with it um, uh, we can discuss it on Tuesday next and uh, and put it to bed okay so you're going to try to draft a memo for the commission for next tuesday and then that memo I, I can't think of any other way to do it i mean that's but, fine uh, I understand. we can but if, do it in any form you want but uh if we're going to ask everybody to give some thought to it then it probably ought to be in black and white whether it's a memo or what it, what it is then is it potentially possible to convert that memo to a letter that's going to go to our elected representatives at some point in time? Is that the thought process behind it? Either convert the memorandum or write a letter that goes along with the memorandum. Okay. I mean, uh, Larry or Jennifer, I don't know whether you have any any other views. I think you know we're going to talk tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. I think that if we decide that, I think all of this is great in theory. Again, there's nothing that's live, right? There's nothing right. live in heart right. right now. So this is all great as a way of getting ahead of it. So I think that's fantastic. 
now what goes to the house in January may have parts of this in it and may have parts that we're addressing that they may never even address. So I think it's it's probably prudent for us to do it. We're a little, I think in some ways, we're ahead of the game. So if we needed a little bit more time after we talk tomorrow, I also, unless you tell us, Steve, that we can't do that, right? Do we have to put it on the agenda for next week if we're gonna present something? Well, if you're putting it, we'd say we're always here to sub kind of report on possible legislation. I think that's all that you need to do. Um, but if you're gonna do a public hearing, well, I don't think we. I mean, I don't we're not ready to do a public hearing. No, I think the commission hasn't even discussed. Right. And as Jennifer acknowledged, yeah. there's nothing currently pending, and nothing's going to be pending till late December, early January for the January special session. Fred and I have volunteered to get some more information to the subcommittee. We've been into a number of different conference calls, meetings, webinars over the past week or two that we can kind of relay what we've heard, what Darian has in its regs, or doesn't have in its regs, or could change in its regs, backup data, mapping, things that might help the committee with an understanding of, in certain cases, we might be doing something already, or close to doing something, or with a few changes, we're already there. And we're pulling that all together. Hopefully, at tomorrow's call, we can do that. So, so the the what what right now, Dan, from my reading of this, and and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. Of, of the list that I've seen, you know, we the town of Darien does say 90 percent of them. There's a few things that we do not do. There's a few things we we never would right. do. What I've been checking with, I've been speaking to the people from Greenwich and Westport and Ridgefield. We know where Ridgefield stand. I can check in with the chairman of Greenwich, um, their P and Z, and see where they stand or what their process is right now. I don't recall, in fact, if they have set up a subcommittee or not, but that's a simple phone call or, or message to that. Right, um, and it could be that certain yeah. in certain aspects, the Planning and Zoning Commission says, you know what, <laughs> we're willing to make a certain change or changes. Uh, and that, that remains to be seen, but at least we can get Jennifer, Jim, and Larry uh, more information tomorrow. Fred and I have been working in, in the background on various things that might be helpful to better understand where we stand relative to them. Okay. Right. I, I think, Steve, the way I would say it is we've all found a lot of information on a lot of different topics, and it's made it a little more complex, and I think what we need to do tomorrow is just get together go through what we know, make it concise, and then provide something to this committee that we can just all agree is what, what, what our group thought of it. But I don't want to speak for anybody else until we have a meeting and decide exactly what we all think and feel because I, you know, I, I think I know, but I don't know until I know. Aaron, your mic is open. Do you want to chime in? Um, yeah, I think what I would just, you know, sort of like to comment on is, you know, while things may not be live, I don't think that's a reason to not do the homework and form a view regarding information and things that are currently in draft bills and have been in previous draft bills. Because I think how you advocate for the stakeholders and voters in Darien, which I think is what our role is, is by advocating before things are before the House and the Senate, because at that point, it's almost too late. So I think, you know, part of representing and have and and you know being a voice for your town and your municipality is not waiting and advocating to decision you know, right to the people who have the ability to vote on these things before it's too late and um you know things are always in flux until right the last hour before the votes are in and i think time is of the essence and really taking a well thought out um thorough analysis of these bills and what the unintended or intended collateral consequences are and having a view on them and advocating for change and for our stakeholders is important. 
it, 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 these bills can they can come and go as the, as they come. You can pull at the last minute. From what I was told, they tried to let's be part down. of the influence, right? Let's not just be sitting there on the sidelines. Let's be right. part of. And I think you know, to your point on our regs, you know, I think we meet a large percentage, almost probably what like ninety percent of what um advocacy groups are looking for and i think we should also be looking at simultaneously with right trying to influence lawmakers in hartford um is also where there's places we can change our own regulations to i think george you know this was probably your line that i might have stolen for you which is like the goals of much of these are very admirable right and the devil is in the details so i think many of the goals or the you know end results we can maybe change our regs to already address some of the concerns so i think where we can do that we should and then where there are things like jim's point of um taking away local control of what the law you know laws versus regs are and just being sort of like the towing the line people you know we should be an, you know a voice for you know influencing the decision makers in hartford that we think local control is important um i we can think of another examples where hartford doesn't understand right our five mile river and you know what sort of our topography is and what our environmental situation is here um and so, and also getting neighbor buy-in for certain things, which I heard on one of the calls. So I think there's a lot of reasons why it's important both to make changes where we can in our own regulations to sort of address some of the concerns that the lawmakers and the advocates have, and also simultaneously to be a voice of influence um, where there is legislation that may um, impact our local, you know, stakeholders. Right. It, uh, I 100 percent agree with you. It because I, I do like I was saying earlier. I, I think this was partially supposed to be on like a September set special session. They tried. They tried and didn't get it. So I do think you're going to be in front of it. And and Kara, to your point, some of the things that if we can do it, we want to do it. You know, that's great. Me personally, I have no interest in putting in private sewer systems in our town being a coastal town someone wants to put a private sewer system in on delafield island because they can't you know I, I i would never say yes to that and that's what i think i read in there i mean to me it's local control um you know the the adu thing you know we can talk about that um there was something else i saw about about building height um you know our fire equipment only goes up the four-story building you're going to buy us a new fire truck if you make it the stories we already talked about that one what do you offer i think you know it's let's let the subcommittee you know yeah, I think those guys figure it out and yeah, right. yeah and i think it's just important to note we will have this is good for us to get in front of it but just like in january where there's five thousand bills that come in at the end of the year there's 250 right so we will have time to also go back and say, hey, we heard what you said. Did you see what we wrote? And we want to reiterate it. So I think we have time to also go back and reiterate our position as a town and to devil in the details, pivot as we need to. Agreed. Great. I just appreciate all the work that you guys are putting in on doing this thing. Um, because I know it's not easy and there's a lot to go and you know, everyone's got other stuff to do. Um, the only thing I do want to tell you guys, um, I looking at my screen in our meeting is Margarita Alban, who is the chairman of the Penning Zoning Commission for the town of Greenwich. Does anybody want to hear directly from her on what Greenwich is doing? It is a general meeting, so we're not supposed to have public comment, but she, to me, is an expert on this. So if you guys want to hear what she's going to say, um, you hear it directly? Yeah. Yeah, okay. definitely. Mar Margarita, welcome to the Deering and Penning Zoning Commission general meeting. Um, you heard what we just said. We have our subcommittee. I don't recall if you set up a subcommittee or not, um, but uh, tell us what we did. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, we do not have a subcommittee. 
We've actually been tackling it through our affordable housing task force and talking about it a great deal as a commission in the whole. Uh, in regard to what the right thing is, I think you guys are on the money that we're not going to see anything until the beginning of next year. But I talked to Senator Anwar, who drafted the first, you know, who got the bill in February 2020, and he is revising what he's going to propose. So that whole thing about the septic that Steve was concerned about is going to probably stay there. I also had an exchange with Sarah Bronin from Desegregate this week, and um, I had written her because she keeps showing Greenwich as having our minimum lot sizes being four acres. And I said, no, in fact, it's 7,500 square feet, and we have two family zoning by right in that and she answered me that I didn't understand that she needed to demonstrate what the minimum maximum lot size was and that um, Jeremy's nodding because Katie probably talked to you about this, right? My town planner talking to Jeremy, whom she very much respects. Um, and, she, and so Sarah said, we needed to show how you were different from other towns. And I said, but, you know, we have two family zoning. And she said, that's not the point. And I wrote back and I said, so are you thinking of eliminating large acre parcels? And she didn't answer me. She changed the subject and answered something else. So what we're concerned about is that this may seek to eliminate large acre parcels and it's basically looking to do multifamily zoning or to what she calls what they're calling gentle density throughout towns and that's what's worrying us because that's not our development pattern and i pushed back on her and i said what about the rural zones and the agricultural areas how do you handle that and again um no response but I've heard experienced planners refer to what they're suggesting as a very urban model for zoning. At the same time, and I've talked to Steve about this, there's a lawsuit against Woodbridge, Connecticut. Yep, Jeremy knows about it, which seeks to prove that, multi, that single family lots are illegal. Um, there's a couple of lawyers here in town who think that'll end up at the U.S. Supreme Court because that's who originally established the right to zone. So that's going that way. Um, day before yes, you know, yesterday, Desegregate Connecticut was circulating a study that I also sent Steve, which recommends taxing land more than improvements. So the bigger your property size, the higher your tax rate. Um, Steve, you know more about this than I do. It's called land value taxation. Right. Yeah. So if you add all this up, it's what I said to my first selectman yesterday was, we this may go away, but we need to have a strategy and we need to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to combat it because they're looking to change our development pattern. And it is the feeling of some of these, of some of the proponents that we have avoided affordable housing. Um, and I don't believe that that's the case in any of our towns. I think we've genuinely been trying and our real estate prices make it difficult. Um, but there it is. So. Input for us, I'd love to hear from all of you guys. I reach out to Steve fairly often and pepper him with questions about what you guys are doing, but anything else on your minds or that I could add or that you would advise me? Go ahead, I, think, Karen. I think, you know, in thinking about these issues and like looking at 830G, which has been on the books for, you know, however many years, which hasn't really moved the needle on what its stated legislative goal is, and, and again, I'm going to steal George's line again, 
I do think the goal of opportunity and access to less dense, um, higher opportunity zones and better schools. And, you know, I don't know all the proper, you know, taglines for everything, but I get what the goals are. And I'm actually, sure. you know, I think those are our are, are goals that I, I think it's hard not to, you know, support. Um, but what I look at as sort of a large stumbling block is that, you know, having things on statewide mean average versus area wide makes many of these projects, you know, unfeasible from a developer standpoint because of, you know, using the statewide mean for those units as opposed to the area mean. And I think, um, you know, that I think is probably an advocacy point in, you know, with legislators. And I don't know what, if it will be dead on arrival, it probably will. But if that's really the goal of getting sort of different, you know, families that are struggling, but could get here, you know, but they don't, they're, you know, the, you know, depending on how you, you know, calculate where they fall in the mean average, I think all those kind of things matter towards um, making these projects feasible. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think if the real goal is to, you know, provide greater access, um, I think those are kind of the ways you can do it. Um, as I think about it and as I see things, when you look at like sort of the Atlas calculations. Um, yeah, and sort of those are kind of my thoughts on it. Um, but I agree with you. I think this is more about um, changing the way certain communities look in terms of how they're developed. Yes, 20% um, of our school kids are on Alice. Yeah. Uh, what are the what interesting- Alice, what, uh, What's Alice mean? Uh, uh, lunch subsidized lunch programs and below. Yeah. below. Um, you guys have all these acronyms that I don't know. What <laughs> I didn't know what ADUs were until two months ago. When um, one of the interesting comments that has come out from you and New Canaan, and also Ridgefield mentioned it the other day, is that even when you build affordable housing, your racial and ethnic profile doesn't change much. Um, I have a feeling that it's about job access more than anything else that you can build affordable housing but it has to be convenient to transit into employment and so forcing people to build it when they're you're not offering the rest of the package may not make sense but i don't know if we have any traction with that argument um by the way we have made a big effort um, to get the state to change from state medium to local area median income without success. We did it about 15 okay. years ago. The um, 830G, as you know, has been around for 30 years. Um, we actually fuss more about the fact that it has the, that you have to have deed restricted um, housing yeah. because we think we actually, and you guys probably do too, you have much more than anybody will count. But because of the way you've structured it, um, it doesn't count for the state. Jeremy's nodding. Yeah, <laughs> so you've been talking to Katie. Almost like deed restricted zoning has also gone before the Supreme Court, and you know, even though they can't be changed, it can be held to be unenforceable. So, yeah. right? I mean, I'm from Long Island, so I'm very familiar with the Levittown developments, and right how groundbreaking they were but also how they had significant you know social and racial issues and those were deed restricted and the supreme court clearly held that those you know discriminatory deed restrictions are unenforceable yeah. um so i think put it just because you have something in a deed and a deed can't be changed pursuant you know by state law doesn't mean they're necessarily enforceable down the road right yeah i we've kind of wondered that we've gone down that same same road a couple of times do we really have to uh, one of the things i asked senator anwar is that he consider not requiring deed restriction um the other thing and steve and i talked about this the other day how they do hue points you're working on your new moratorium um it, that pre-1990 is that right steve yeah. 
for HUE points. And then Steve and I were doing the math of how much money you would have to spend to get all those units to count. But the bottom line is, I'm not, I don't know if anything we do right now is gonna, is gonna change how the legislation, no matter what we do to comply, we're making a huge effort to comply. I just don't know if it's gonna change the path of the legislation that's proposed because it's proposed from two different camps. One is Senator Anwar and the other is Sarah Bronin. And it's strong she, enough. Excuse me? Oh, Maybe she an elected official? No. Well, curiously, she was chair of the Hartford PNZ for a long time. Right. But I mean, she kind of pulls legislation. She's a lobbyist, essentially. And she's obviously married to politicians. Or like married What's to makers. I'd like to get George Riley to um, to comment in. I see your mic is open, but we haven't heard from your your opinion, George. You don't mind. Well, thanks for that opportunity. I I just I did uh, listen in on a webinar this week uh, where Sarah Bronin was a principal speaker along with Tim Hollister, who's uh, another yeah. one of the uh, lead members of the land use bar, who was I think at our last meeting on behalf of an applicant. So both uh, you know what we call high power folks. But they were they were pretty darn strident when in their language they they were talking about eliminating the word character they referred to it as sarah in particular called it morally repugnant to use the word character uh, that we should want to uh, preserve character and um, uh, the local control hollister was talking about he said local control is absurd uh, the feds in the state already control energy and uh and other aspects coastal uh, waters and uh, uh all kinds of different aspects he said it's just absurd but if you were designing zoning today you would never have 169 different zoning boards you'd have a state uh, model for zoning uh and these these folks are uh, they've got a head up up of steam uh that's what i I'm trying to impart, and I'm still surprised it isn't getting more attention around here. Again, as I did say, their 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 goals are are laudable. Uh, they they firmly believe that uh, single family zones are discriminatory. Um, they just uh, you know it, it goes back to the days of those restricted uh, um, deeds, I suppose, when it was for whites only, and they say that that's what's still happening so um you know not with that not so blatant but that's the reality they would say of single family zones single family only zones um that's um uh, uh I, I think they are simply a force to be reckoned with as margarita was suggesting as well uh and um uh and i think as we deal with them we have to be aware of where they're coming from the only, the only, thing, the only thing i know you can do is they say write your congressman you know it's if you can write your congressman and they represent you and they stand up for you you know they're going to stand up for you if that's what we asked the guy that we elected for our district that's what we ask if they vote against what the dairy and planning zoning commission says and they represent the dairy and zoning commission so, I don't know what you well yeah i mean no, I, I i think and this is what this subcommittee is is in, I think needs to spend its time on tomorrow because this is all great info. It's really in the weeds. And I think we need to come up with something that just to let the people of Darien and of Greenwich and other towns know what's coming down the pike and maybe just some simple, clear examples of why local control is important. Um, people keep talking about large zoning areas like you know two acre zoning town i spoke to someone i've used this analogy before but i know margarita probably didn't hear me say it a good friend of mine lived in wilton said well i had a two acre zone and you needed that because the well had to be a certain distance from the septic system and if you didn't have two two acres you know you weren't healthy that's what that in my nutshell is why local zoning is important because you're gonna have all these local issues that only the local board knows how to understand and handle. And that cannot, and you know, and I would I would 
disagree stridently with him that if you design zoning today, you would do it from central planning. Central planning has never worked. We know that. <laughs> I mean, I work in national real estate business. The city of Houston has no zoning. <laughs> you know, the state doesn't regulate anything. It's all done right. by that's Texas. Oh, Texas, it's I can do whatever I want on my property. But no, no, no. Right. It is now. And, and it works for the people who live there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's for them. It's now 1030. Um, you know, I, I think I think we're on the right path. I think all of our, our ideas are, are getting out there. I personally think that the general public in Darien is going to be appreciative of what um, we're doing. Um, if we can get something from from the subcommittee next week to look at and digest whatnot, I think would be Our great. goal is after we talk to get you something to review so that we can come to Tuesday's meeting having reviewed it already and be able to jump into discussions a lot quicker. Okay. And then we don't have a meeting on we have a meeting on then. We don't have a meeting on election day. We meet on the tenth. Um, so we meet on the tenth, so we can go over what you have on Tuesday. Then you know you can talk about it amongst your friends during election day, and then you know we can talk about it again on the tenth. And at some point in time, when when we are ready, and when the subcommittee is ready to answer what Jennifer asked at day one, is we can put it on a general meeting agenda. I don't think we. I I take back that suggestion. I don't know if that's the best. We have public hearing. Public hearing. Public hearing. I know. I, I'll defer to the lawyers on the commission on whether they think that's a great idea or not. Before, um, I mean, we're doing our homework as a committee, and I don't know whether before things move down the line, it's going to be more. I don't know. I, I'm not sure how but how good. It, I'm not sure how prudent it will be now. I mean, I don't know either, but I know the Board of Education, they do public comment all the time. And somebody says, we're going to do COVID, and there was 900 people. I mean, look at how it mattered, and it, it affected the debate and the legislation on regionalization of schools. Right. And so yeah. I think allowing right. the public to comment and getting ahead of the issues and mobilizing stakeholders actually makes a difference. And so now, we've seen it year and it's been admirable right watching people get involved and be vocal and active on issues and i think this is no different but now this is my question now opposed to when we know what's now right you're never going to know when it's going to be calendared and they're going to like try to like lull people into being complacent and not being active by saying we're going to kick it down the road kick it down the road Right, you have to give people a sense of urgency to realize this is happening and this is important, and that's how you get people to, you know, zero in and realize it's a real important issue. And giving the public the right to speak about it is democracy, and right, this affects them. And I think they should have every opportunity to speak about it. And we shouldn't be part of the, you know, big machine that wants to kick it down the road and. You know, make people complacent. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying I, I just want to stress it. I just want to make sure everyone was on the same page because yeah, I don't. No, know. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. advocate that the town take a position. You got to let the people in the town express their have an opportunity to express their views. Right. I mean, I've seen people do it certain point in time where they have the public hearing in August. August, you know, 10th. All of Darien is in Nantucket or, or you know, or Rhode Island or Block Island on August 10th. Nobody's around. Mm -hmm. You know, we got time now. So I, I think we're all agreed that public comment and public input is the more the better. Thank you. All right. Um, with that said, um, our meeting is basically, oh, and the other thing, just remember it's for your education on November 10th, we're doing officer elections. Yeah, that'll be on the agenda too. So that's on the agenda for um, November 10th. Um, that covers our entire, and Marguerite, if you're still here, I think you might be. Thank you very much for your comments and questions and being here. Um, if you ever see her name, come on another meeting. She does seem to pop in every now and again. <laughs> so. I'm just PNZ. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Bye, you guys. It was fun talking to you. Oh, okay. You added a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you.
All right. With that said, our next two meetings are on, we just talked about it, October 27th. We have off on November um, 3rd, and we have November 10th. Am I missing anything, or can I call for a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Uh, looking for a motion to adjourn. So move. Thank you, Jim Rand. Second by Kara Gately. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.